Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Desai. I'm one of the uh, members of the Society of Fellows. Uh, it's wonderful to be here um, and to uh, moderate this final session, um, which I think is going to be in and of itself a fantastic session and also introduce uh, uh, us uh, at the very end to get some opportunity to uh, uh, wrap up uh, collectively. Um, if I'm just going to invite, it's an open invitation, if anybody towards the back of the room would like to migrate forward. If you migrate to the front row, we probably won't be able to see you, uh, such as the setup of this higher education. Um, but if you wanted to come a few rows uh, forward, um, uh, that would be uh, most welcome. I am going to refrain from uh, taking on the yoga industrial complex uh, and um, doing poses on the uh, stage, uh, but we are going to try to have some fun today. Uh, that brings me to our first speaker, uh, Roosevelt Montas, who is director of the Center for the Core Curriculum at Columbia University. He specializes in antebellum American literature and culture with a specific interest in citizenship and American national identity. In addition to directing Columbia's Center for the Core Curriculum, where he has taught both literature, humanities, and contemporary civilization, he lectures and writes about the history and future of liberal education. And um, on the subject of fun, I was talking to him about teaching in the core at Columbia, and uh, in about two minutes, he mentioned the word fun uh, four times. Um, fun is not totally dead at Chicago, but he may be having more fun uh, at Columbia. Uh, clearly, he's a passionate educator, and it's wonderful to have him here. I didn't realize those were trick questions you were asking. <laughs> um, before I, I, I lunch into my remarks, I want to thank Aaron and Aviva, as, as many others have, but it's well deserved. This has been, I think, a, a, a remarkable set of conversations that you have organized and orchestrated. Um, I particularly want to um, commend you for making sure that, that we talked about equity and access as we did in, in the last panel. Um, there is a, a, a movement happening in, in liberal arts education where we are drifting again to a kind of education that is accessible only to the already privileged in society. And uh, apart from thinking about what we actually do in liberal education, this other aspect of uh, who we do it with, I think, is is of um, extreme and urgent importance. And even though I'm not going to talk about that um, in in my in my remarks, I uh, commend the organizers for making sure that that was um, a, an important aspect of our discussion. Um, I, I want to think about the title of this panel: the task of the li liberal educator through two dichotomies: um, outside, inside and professional epistemological. So um, on this first dichotomy outside, in, inside, as, as liberal arts educators, we face an outside challenge and an inside challenge. The outside challenge has to do with how hard it is to promote liberal arts education in an environment that increasingly sees education in instrumental terms only, and environments that favors vocational, professional, or specialized education. Uh, and several good books have come out in, in recent years addressing this outside challenge um, that is making the case to the general public about the value of liberal arts education. Uh, it's a case that we need to continue making. But there is also an inside challenge. That is a challenge within our institutions. This inside challenge, in turn, has two facets. One is professional and one epistemological. Let me say some words about each of those challenges, beginning with the professional one. A big part of the professional problem that those of us who profess the liberal arts face comes from the fact that since the end of the 19th century, the institutions where we work have been dominated by science. And by science, I simply mean the empirical investigation of the natural world. Uh, although I am a humanist by training and by conviction, I have to admit that the curricular centrality of science in the university strikes me as entirely appropriate. Yet, we humanists, professors of the liberal arts, work in an area that is largely impervious to empirical investigation. 
It is, of course, subject to rational investigation, though even reason has its limits here. But the broad field with which the liberal arts concern themselves is not the proper study, the proper object of empirical study. But we find ourselves in institutions that are dedicated to scientific standards of objectivity, of verifiability, of cumulative progress, and to use William James Crass' phrase, to the cash value of knowledge. It would take more time than I have to flesh this out, but we have to admit that the practice of the liberal arts doesn't quite fit the epistemological requirements that dominate within the university. The dominance of this scientific paradigm has led to greater and greater specialization in the disciplines and to a misguided notion of research that regulates promotions and status even within the liberal arts. The liberal arts in the main appear today within universities in the guise of majors, which are themselves embedded in specialized departments whose methods and whose budgets are discipline specific and which aim to prepare students for advanced work within those disciplines. But that structure of disciplinary majors meant to equip the students for further specialization is from its very conception illiberal. We fundamentally miss the point if we think that, if we think of liberal arts as a particular specialty among other specialties within the university curriculum. I don't think it's an exagger exaggeration to say that a liberal arts specialization is an, is an oxymoron. The second inside challenge I want to point to, as I said, is epistemological. And it has to do with an incapacity to articulate, much less defend, the vision values and aims that guide our practice as liberal educators. Liberal arts professors, it seems, suffer from a sort of, of infancy, uh, a lack of speech, an inability to speak about the ends of liberal education and about the kind of human life that is presupposed in the practice of liberal education. This epistemological paralysis which is not about how the general public sees us, but about how we see ourselves and how we behave within our institutions is, in my view, our most serious challenge. It's a near truism that what we teach is always a function of what we value. What we teach, how we teach it, and who we teach it to necessarily describes a vision of society and of the types of individuals we want to rear into that society. There is no such thing as a values-free education. Values permeate everything about education, and not from the outside as an ideological add-on, but from the inside as constitutive of the very thing that is meant by education. Our very practice as liberal arts professors implies a vision of society and a set of values about the meanings of a human life. We have to be able to describe those values and stand behind that vision. But do we know what that vision is and what those values about the meanings of a human life are? And do we have the vocabulary with which to talk about those values and that vision? This is an important question for us today because the liberal arts, at least in their academic manifestation, seem a bit like Dante's pilgrim, having lost their way and apparently going to hell. Whenever I think about our work as teachers, I am brought back to Emerson's Divinity School Address as a foundational text for what it means to be a professor of the liberal arts. In that address to young men about to enter the ministry, Emerson declared that, truly speaking, it is not instruction but provocation that I can receive from another soul. We should remember that as we do that, that what we do as liberal arts professors is much more than transmitting knowledge. In fact, the main way in which we teach is not by communication, but by contagion. As liberal arts teachers, we infect our students with certain attitudes about what it means, about what it means to be a free human being. As the Harvard Red Book of 1945 put it, he only teaches in this field by letting his students watch the play of a mind with a mind that their minds may play in turn. But of course, we cannot communicate the disorienting shocks of recognition that characterize inner development unless we have been open 
to them ourselves in our own lives. So I want to say that there is a lot of work for us to do in ourselves, inner work, the hard work of self-transformation, of committing ourselves to ceaseless, ceaselessly to authentic and honest living, to lives of integrity and virtue. I cannot see but that those personal commitments are conditions for the effective exercise of our profession. We are professors. Well, what do we profess? What is our calling? We err if we imagine that we can simply produce footnote saturated scholarly commentaries on important works and be with that done with our jobs. Indeed, we err if we imagine scholarly production to be our primary job. And we err further if we think that we can produce meaningful humanistic scholarship by the mere exercise of intellectual prowess. As professors of the liberal arts, our teaching and our scholarship must emerge organically from our whole lives, not just from our professional ambitions. I want to end with a quote from Emerson's Divinity School Address. Um, Emerson speaks here about the preacher, the church, and the worshipers. And I want to make the parallel explicit because I think this very much applies to us as teachers, to our classrooms, and to our students. Here's the quote, whenever the pulpit is usurped by a formalist, then is the worshiper defrauded and disconsolate. We shrink as soon as prayers begin, which do not uplift, but smite and offend us. We are fain to wrap our cloaks about us and secure as best we can a solitude that hears not. I once heard a, pre a preacher who sorely tempted me to say I would go to church no more. Men go, thought I, where they are wont to go, else had no soul entered that temple in the afternoon. A snowstorm was falling around us, the snowstorm was real, the preacher merely spectral. And the eye felt the sad contrast in looking at him and then out the window behind him into the beautiful meteor of snow. He had lived in vain. He had not, no one word intimating that he had laughed or wept, was married or in love, had been commended or cheated or chagrined. If he had ever lived and acted, we were none the wiser for it. The capital secret of his profession, namely to convert life into truth, he had not learned. Not one fact in all his experience had he yet imported into his doctrine. This man had plowed and planted and talked and bought and sold, he had read books, he had eaten and drunken, his head aches, his heart throbs, his smiles and suffers, yet was there not a surmise, a hint in all the discourse that he had ever lived at all. Not a line did he draw out of his real history. The true preacher can be known by this, that he deals out to the people his life. Life passed through the fire of thought. We as a cadre of professionals have become too much like that dreary preacher. Our students come to us looking for something real, but we are all too happy to shift attention elsewhere, to apply scholarly and scholastic anesthetics, playing an institutionalized academic game that we know is at bottom a sham. And this, to my eyes, is the real crisis of the liberal arts today. Our students are not indifferent to inner awakening. They are, in fact, obsessed with moral questions, racked with existential anxiety and struggling with the threat of meaninglessness. They have their doubts about the prevailing value system of our late capitalist market-driven culture. They wonder whether the frantic pursuit of success, wealth, and status will actually satisfy the longing in their hearts. The liberal arts are here precisely to equip those students with tools with which to navigate those difficult waters. We should not disappoint them. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kareem Yasin Gosinger, who uh, is the founder of the Cairo Institute of the Liberal Arts and Sciences. He currently serves as program director and chairman of the board of trustees. Uh, Kareem studied uh, political philosophy and urban governance in the Netherlands, Brazil, France, and has worked with a range of development agencies in Latin America and in the Middle East in fields including microfinance, informal housing, and local governance. In addition to his interest in social and political theory, 
He is concerned with the intersection of post-secondary education and development work. Uh, he, I think, has come the farthest for this uh, uh, conference. And to be commended, he has fought through jet lag. Uh, and I think maybe at this moment, contemplating if it might make sense to open up a Chicago uh, campus uh, branch of the Cairo Institute. Uh, yeah. Maybe that will give you uh, a little bit of time to recover. Please. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone for still being here. And Awake? Huh? Mm -hmm. I saw you. <laughs> um, uh, I thought I should start with a with a short disclaimer before before I begin to read to you. Uh, I arrived three days ago at O'Hare uh, Airport, and uh, upon arrival, I was detained for four hours. And the fourth hour, I was in interrogation by a, a man called uh, Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's already funny, I agree. Uh, and you couldn't help but imagine Napoleon next to him, but he was the exact opposite. of. He was tall and he had a very angry, grim face. And, um, and he, once he ran out of questions after an hour or so, um, he went through my bag and paid, took out every item uh, and asked questions about it, why I had packed it and everything. And then he put everything back in and looked at me and said, you're a highly unusual character. Uh, and I think my take on liberal education is, is somewhat unusual as well. So, so bear with me. Perhaps there's something there. OK. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking Aviva Rothman and, and Aaron Tugendhaft for allowing me to be part of this conversation on liberal education. I'll be sharing with you an experience in liberal education from outside the West, uh, more precisely from Cairo, Egypt, where I founded the Cairo Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences, or CELIS for short, in 2013. I set up CELUS with the intention of inviting students from different socioeconomic backgrounds to engage with the liberal arts in a post-revolutionary Egypt. It has been an amazing experience, and I'm excited to be here to share with you a few insights we have started to uncover around space, informality, and playfulness. I was inclined at first to fill the 10 minutes assigned to me here today sharing anecdotes about the days, if not weeks, I spent drinking tea at different government agencies with government agents ranging from ministerial busboys to various ministers. For one thing, I do love anecdotes and tea. Ministerial bustering, however, not so much. To give you an idea about the anecdotal content of these encounters, suffice to say that during each of them I had to prove to my counterpart that I was neither an Israeli spy nor a revolutionary anarchist. Everyone I dealt with remained incredulous as to how I could have foregone the option of living, in a, living a peaceful life in Europe to set up an educational nonprofit in post-revolutionary Egypt. Their puzzlement and concern weren't unfounded, which is something I've only been willing to admit more recently. Indeed, when Aaron asked me to, to, share, um, to share a thought or two on the task of the liberal educator, my immediate response since the rise of blatant fascism in Egypt a few months ago would have been, stay out of prison. This response, of course, isn't limited to a liberal educator. Rather, it applies to any public figure with a so-called liberal or pro progressive hint, be it a human rights activist, street performer, novelist, or critical pedagogue. All of the, these are, are in prison currently. And while interrogations and arrests of friends and fellow liberals continue haphazardly, I wish to focus in my talk on another aspect of Cairo's social reality, more specifically. The point I hope to raise in my talk is that an appreciation of urban informality is fundamental to good learning. In other words, I wish to demonstrate that liberal education, and by extension the task of the liberal educator, must celebrate some degree of informality. Throughout my talk, I'd like to maintain that Cairo's social spatial reality, which reflects the reality of the post-colonial metropolis, serves as a fertile breeding ground for the liberal educator in the Egyptian context. Both Ivan Illich and Paolo Freire remind us of the social-emotional character of the process of knowing. Knowing or learning is an interpersonal and emotional encounter just as much as it is intellectual. I wish to add to their contribution the inherent spatiality of the process of knowing. Illich writes that to know is ultimately a personal experience, and that the only way to know, that is, to widen one's competencies for living, is to learn from the world. I drew from this reminder that the kind of educational journey I had envisioned to resonate with and matter to students after 25th of 
January Revolution had to be grounded in Cairo's every day. Together with the students, we discovered modes of learning and encounter that emerged naturally as we came together in different settings and at different hours in the aftermath of the revolution. Illich and Freire interpreted learning from the world differently from the way I did, however. While Illich emphasized in his writing the perks of an amateurish way of being in the world, Freire wished to cultivate literacy and textuality so that people could become conscious of their being in the world. I think that both interpretations have their drawbacks, but wish to elaborate here on my own bias, which is an urban bias. Are there good reasons to believe that Cairo's informality could or should be instructive to the process of knowing, I began to wonder? It was, my, it was to my mind Cairo's supposed ungovernability, its incessant unbearability, and its ever surprising uncertainty paired with its stimulating complexity, its manifold potentialities, and its sheer humanity that captivated me. I found this duality of impossibility and fecundity often to be reduced to the single measure of informality. A value-laden term, informality must be recognized in its entirety if we are to appreciate its ambivalent nature and rid ourselves of the colonial tendencies of urban imagination. Most, rap most rapid urban growth, notably across Africa today, is in fact informal. It is beyond the reach of governments and outside the shadow of the law. At more local scales, urban informality highlights how much of urban life in a place like Cairo takes place off the record, is unlicensed and in defiance of regulation. To quote Ananya Roy, informality is not simply one idiom of urbanization, but its first language. I think that this language of informality can tell us something about critical pedagogy, and hence about the task of the critical pedagogue or liberal educator. This is particularly true if we bear in mind that urban informality is necessarily inventive. Informality is increasingly recognized for its tactical and resourceful colonization of space, as well as its clever econo economies and disruptive sociability. Think, think of highly efficient rag pickers collectives, notably in Egypt and India, or women's credit unions and lending cooperatives across Latin America and Africa. In the popular ima imagination, however, informality is often fallaciously equated with poverty. It would, in fact, be overly static and, and outrage outright essentialist to insist on categorizing the informal and to pin it down in both to topographical and ontological terms. In other words, it would be plain wrong to reduce informal urban spaces to the habitus of the dispossessed. Informal, urban, ur informal urbanity, in brief, is perhaps best understood as a historically situated worldview and way of life that is characterized by complexity, ambivalence, movement, and a specific set of daily skills that are rooted in the quotidian experience and can hardly be systemized by technocratic planners or state actors. My suggestion is that this context has a profound impact on pedagogy. Urban informality invites the liberal educator to dwell in a state of radical and enduring uncertainty. To me, the liberal educator of the post-colonial metropolis is a paradoxical figure, an exceptionally crafty being that embodies the shapes of things to come. The liberal is at e the liberal educator is at ease with the informal. He, he immerses in it. What I'm really trying to say is that education needs to be messy and informal, to some extent anyway. What got me thinking about all of this are Cairo's street cafes. For those of you who have been to Cairo, I'm talking about the Ehewi al which literally translates to rural cafes. These street cafes extend and distend with the seasons of the city and escape the caprices of the regulator. There are always enough chairs and always enough tea. It was in spending endless nights with friends and members of the extended revolutionary family at these street cafes that I realized I wanted to set up Silas. The hour-long discussions we had at different and ever-changing cafes inside narrow alleys, in front of the stock exchange, on main boulevards, and in dimly lit back streets were amazing, yet frustrating to me. They were amazing discussions because in my eyes they manifested the weak messianic force, okay. restored by the revolutionary act to borrow a notion from Walter Benjamin. I found fascinating the sense of wonderment, or ta'amul in Arabic, expressed during our conversations. The word ta'amul is most commonly translated as meditation or contemplation, but it is also rooted in the word amal, for hope. Hence, what I observed in light of the heightened sense of wonderment was a self-revealed questionability of things a commitment to inverting the seemingly obvious, and a subversiveness of mind and body that delegitimized any established form of dominion. 
It was as if an inherent inquisitiveness that lay dormant was, awa was awakening. It was at street cafes that I witnessed not only the sense of wonderment, but also what I believe might be best described as paresia. To use a term Michel Foucault evoked in a lecture he gave in Berkeley in 1983. Foucault explains at length that in Parisia, we have a verbal activity in which the speaker expresses his personal relation to truth and risks his life because he recognizes truth-telling as a duty to improve or help other people, as well as himself. In Parisia, the speaker uses his freedom and chooses frankness instead of persuasion, truth instead of falsehood or silence, the risk of death instead of life and security, criticism instead, instead of flattery, and moral duty instead of self-interest and moral apathy. What frustrated me, however, during my hour-long conversations with friends is that none of the brilliant ideas uttered in their rawest and most direct form came to fruition. We weren't given the opportunity to construct anything from the raw material. Allow me to refer to Walter Benjamin one more time as he captures mo my concern most vividly. Benjamin writes that, and I quote, Thinking involves not only the movement of thoughts, but their arrest as well. Where thinking suddenly comes to a stop in a constellation, pregnant with tensions, it gives that constellation a shock by which thinking is crystallized. In this crystallized structure, we recognize the sign of a messianic arrest of happening, or to put it differently, a revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed past. It is here that we establish a conception of the present as now time, or jetzt Zeit, shot through with splinters of messianic time, end of quote. This jetzt Zeit, or now time, as I understand it, is a time that is susceptible to action rather than a point in a predetermined continuum or narrative in which agency is located elsewhere. It was my frustration that got me thinking and eventually acting. I went ahead and set up a liberal arts-focused space that would preserve the impermanence and the in-betweenness of the street cafe a microcosm of sorts that would be conducive to Parisia and that reflected the larger social spatial reality it was embedded in. At the same time, I began to work on finding a way to arrest thought as to enable students to explore the crystallized structure of their thoughts. It was my firm belief then that in doing so, together, we would seize the revolutionary chance in the fight of the oppressed. To conclude, I hope that this talk would invite us to appreciate urban informality and consider ways for the liberal educator to be immersed in it. As liberal arts colleges are disappearing in Japan, re-emerging in Europe, being founded in the global south, and reinventing themselves as startup factories in the US, I see an opportunity to think about how to integrate the so-called so informal practices into liberal education. The last theoretical insight I wish to provide borrows from Friedrich Schiller the German Romantic Poets, Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Men. Schiller reminds us of the importance of play. He writes of a play drive that transcends the competing claims of our sensible and formal drives, that is, between our feelings and thoughts. My point is that if we want to play and thereby have approximate intuition of our humanity, as Schiller suggests, we should allow informality to weaken the formal drive, allow the sensible drive to strive, and hence begin to play. In practice, that means allowing for less formal encounters in less regimented spaces and at less regimented paces. In this sense, I invite you to embrace informality in your teaching, your institutions, and your souls, and to spend more time with your students at the cafe. Thank you. <laughs>
um, which didn't necessarily surprise me coming from somebody who um, had been uh, uh, involved in the Committee on Social Thought. Um, but what I noticed throughout the night, and particularly on our uh, ride home, um, was how good a listener he was. Uh, listening is one of the skills I try to teach in my core humanities uh, classes, and uh, I think it's uh, increasingly rare in liberal education. And it was wonderful to come across somebody with both the sharp wit and the great listening uh, capacity. Daniel. And I want to thank, of course, uh, Aaron and to Aviva uh, for putting together uh, such a richly rewarding set of papers and discussions today from which I've learned a great deal. <clears throat> it's probably not an exaggeration to say that the only authority in our day which enjoys uncontested universal recognition is modern science. The situation in the beginning of our century is unique. No political analysis of anything going on can be adequate without an awareness of this uniqueness. But what is the meaning of this uniqueness? In every age, there is something which we can call a basic opinion by which people are united, even in their fights. For religious wars presuppose that religion is worth fighting for. So what is the ruling opinion of our age? If we look at Western countries, we can say it is democracy, and the other element of the uniqueness is modern science. The ruling opinion is democracy and science in such a way that the two are thought to be in basic harmony. The method of democracy is the method of intelligence, whereas democracy is the ruling opinion in many states, science is ruling everywhere. For the first time, there is one ruling opinion. This is unique. Strictly speaking, science can't be an authority accepted blindly, and yet modern science takes on this character. Uh, people take this faith that people can be united through the quest for or respect for truth in and through reason. This hope can be called rationalism. This is the best basic stratum of our present opinion. Originally, the purpose of science was to discover relations, causes, laws, and not only facts. Science presupposes such a thing as causality. What about the modern status of the principle of causality? It's now regarded as a mere assumption. Modern rationalism bases its whole endeavor on an unevident assumption. Science has today externally the greatest triumph. No society can resist it, whereas religion was superior to Newtonian cosmology. Yet the triumph is hollow because the reason within science declares itself incompetent for the greatest purpose, deciding the ends and the basic foundation of causality. So our much vaunted science and its fruit, modern technology, need no longer possess any essential relation to wisdom. It's but an accident if a scientist or engineer, even a world-class scientist or engineer, happens to be wise or ethical, either personally or politically. So the problem with engineering education and liberal education are reflections of the problem of our time, the relation between reason and the human good. Over the last century, dominant opinion has come to accept that there is no possibility of a rational or scientific knowledge of values. In other words, it's now commonly believed that science or reason is incompetent to distinguish good or evil ends. So goes the story of the history of the social sciences in the United States. One would have expected these fields to be disciplines in which the political and moral life of humanity uh, to be seriously discussed. But ever since the fact-value distinction was propounded by the German sociologists of the 1890s and popularized by Max Weber and then imported into this country by sociologists and political scientists in the 1920s, the goals by which we guide our lives have come to be seen as a horizon that is constituted not by reason, but by acts of human creativity. Hence, no horizon can claim to be authoritative or demonstrable, just more or less creative or authentic, whatever that means. While Weber was persuaded of the truth of his analysis, and labored to salvage some possibility for the existence and affirmation of science, the reasonable quest for objective truth, um, our American social scientists devoted little energy to assessing the effect of the distinction or even proving its validity. They simply accepted it and set themselves the task of elaborating a vast objective social science on its basis, enthralled by the hope of social science equal to the natural sciences. Although the results of all their efforts have been less than impressive, the triumph of their ethos or point of view has been nearly total. And yet most social and natural scientists and engineers still take it for granted that things like health, long life, security, 
and pros uh, prosperity are good things, and it's the aim of the various scientists and engineers to procure them. But can these aims claim the evidence they once possessed? Since reason or science cannot establish these ends for which it seeks the means, in practice what happens is the scientists and engineers are compelled to satisfy the ends which are determined and sought by so-called, quote, customers. In other words, by the society an individual scientist or engineer happens to be a part of, which in practice means by the non-scientific majority. In short, the peculiar character of our situation is the interplay of majority taste, often scientifically illiterate, to say nothing of liberally educated, with a very impressive high level, but strictly speaking unprincipled, technical efficiency. The technicians must respond to the demands of the society, the non-technically proficient, scientifically illiterate majority. And yet this majority cannot be accountable to anyone for anything. This is the situation in which we find ourselves and hence our felt need to re-raise the question concerning education and science and engineering. Our problem is compounded by the fact that the insufficiently educated exercise an unreasonably determinative influence on education, both its ends and means. To be more precise, the very progress of science and technology produces, as it requires, an ever-increasing drive to specialization. As a result, education goes ever more into the business of producing mere specialists. In such a situation, technical, scientific, and engineering education is in danger of losing its value for the broadening and deepening of a human being, the classical aim of education rightly conceived. Where the alarm is sounded and remedies sought, all too often it is by means of a turn to a new kind of universalism, a sham universalism, born of the vast increase and expansion of our horizon in space and time, oft called globalization or global studies or other trendy words. In other words, there's the attempt to expel the narrowness of specialization by the superficiality of genuine education courses or requirements, a kind of smorgasbord approach, a sampling of the world's wonders, a spectacle that inevitably is little more than exciting, even entertaining, but far from instructive and educating, deepening, or humanizing. Sadly, these, stu these studies tend not to require or deepen our students' knowledge of Sanskrit, classical Chinese, Persian, Amharic, or Creole, and the great civilizations to which they belong. A natural beginning point for such a genuinely humanistic engineering education lies in the sustained study and reflecting on the meaning and value of science and its fruit, engineering and technology for human life. That's the task we set ourselves at MIT's Ben Franklin project. Now a few words uh, on the origins, both of the liberal arts as well as the origins of engineering education. What are they? From where do they come? Why do they become estranged? With these questions in mind, we can begin to rethink some shop-worn assumptions and appreciate both what engineering and technology have brought us, as well as be in a position to appreciate how to assess and improve engineering in science education for leaders in this new century. In the Renaissance, the mutually reinforcing character of engineering and the liberal arts was clearly on display. The great genius Leonardo da Vinci painted and sculpted some of the world's greatest art, as well as designed machines for human flight, called himself simply an engineer. According to da Vinci, it was in engineering, it was in engineering that his intellectual abilities found the widest range of opportunities and called forth his greatest creative intensity. Famously, there is a description of his skills and what is essentially his job application to do uh, Lodovico Sforza for the construction of the Milan Cathedral. Here's da Vinci in his own words, quote, an engineer knows the rules of good building from their origin and knows into how many parts they are divided, what are the causes they keep, that keep together an edifice and make it last, what is the nature of weight and of energy and force, and in what manner they should be combined and related to one another, and what effect they will produce when combined. In yet another bid to another prospective patron, da Vinci enumerates the vast array of items and myriad services he was capable of furnishing relating to war, including fortification, siege machinery, and mechanisms for escaping siege, artillery, and armed vehicles, among others. But in the end, he adds tellingly, quote, in time of peace, I can carry out sculpture in marble, bronze, or clay, and also I can do in painting whatever may be done. Another Renaissance example, which is more than an example, it goes without saying that of the two most notable design and construction projects of the Renaissance, one was the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The engineer in charge was another brilliant Renaissance artist, Michelangelo. The original design, which included a dome, was crafted by architect and engineer Donato Bramante, who did not live to see the project completed. Before he died, Bramante recommended his nephew, the painter Raphael, for the job. Raphael was neither architect nor engineer, but knew enough to strengthen the dome's support columns, which it is acknowledged were required to prevent the 
proposed a structure from collapsing under its own weight. Raphael stayed on the job only five years. Eventually, Michelangelo succeeded him, redesigning and ultimately building the famous dome. Today, the Dome of St. Peter's is but one of a number of the engineer Michelangelo's masterpieces. For example, the Pieta, the Statue of David, and the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Less commonly known is that in addition to the Dome of St. Peter's, Michelangelo rebuilt and refurbished the defensive walls of his native city, Florence, as well as the bridges in Rome and Venice. To accomplish these marvels, Michelangelo spent years in the Carrara Mountains overseeing the quarrying and transport of the marble he intended to carve. His work entailed building the very mountain roads and mechanisms necessary to transport the huge marble blocks. In the Renaissance, to be an artist and engineer were one and the same. Now today we have all but lost the distinction between the arts and the liberal arts. Like so many words, we are imprecise and all too vague, and the term liberal has acquired various meanings at various times. But as others have attested today, the original term liberal arts derives from the Latin word liber, which means free. From the Middle Ages onward, this meant essentially freedom from manual labor, or the freedom conferred by scholarship and the acquisition of knowledge that signifies one's competence to enter any learned area and to be free to work with one's mind rather than solely with one's hands, to do distinctly human work not tied to answering a physical necessity. In the words of Aristotle, the activity befitting a free human being, exercising a good life, not just tending to mere life. In time, the study of the liberal arts achieved the reputation of bestowing the status of both higher freedom as well as civilized gentility. So by liberal education, we mean an education for freedom, especially the freedom of the mind, which consists in awareness and grasp of the most fundamental human alternatives. Such an education is available largely by means of dedicated study of the deepest thinkers and artists of the past. Without the liberating study of such works, one's mind is virtually condemned to be the prisoner of the horizon and authoritative opinions of his or her time and place. And since we live in a democracy, it will mean condemnation of the prejudices, condemnation to the prejudices of public opinion. Something one can learn incidentally from such great thinker as Alexis de Tocqueville in his great book, Democracy in America. It's worth noting that technology and engineering were excluded from this idea. Technology traces its etymology to the Greek word techne, meaning art or craft, and to an even earlier Sanskrit word meaning hand and connoting manual labor. Etymologically, technology is a Greek provenance, its roots techne and logos, meaning respectively art as in useful crafts and articulate speech or discursive reasoning. And yet the Greeks knew nothing of the compound technologos. The only techne of logos they spoke of was the art of speaking, rhetoric, which for the sophists was a means to rationalize political life, freeing it from the need for compulsion. And yet techne is intimately connected with logos and therewith how we understand humanity. According to Aristotle, techne is a disposition or habit of making in contrast with doing, which involves true reasoning. Man's artfulness while manual must be guided by mind and know-how to be truly expertise and transmittable through shop class. Despite the many wonders our modern technologists have wrought throughout much of the 19th century in Anglo-Saxon cultures, technologists were not automatically candidates for genteel society. You may recall, for instance, that the clowns in Shakespeare's play, Midsummer Night's Eve, local craftsmen by trade, are referred to as mechanicals. And according to Aristotle, those who labored in bonastic arts were not fit even for citizenship. The schism, reaching way back to ancient Athens through Shakespeare's Renaissance England, flourished even in Victorian England, which is to say, ironically, alongside the very boom of the Industrial Revolution. And while the British prepared their leaders with a classical liberal arts education, on the European continent, leaders were already being nurtured in the great polytechnic institutions where mathematics and engineering, and not the classics, were the core curriculum. The term polytechnique, which distinguishes several noted engineering institutions, even in this country, is much admired in cultures whose educational heritage comes more from the continental models than the British one. Technologies and the engineers behind it are the primary drivers of the modern world. Our brilliant engineers created the platforms that sustain our world. The globe-shrinking technologies that established and maintain this global immediacy, for example, electricity and electronics, ground, air, and space transport, radio and television broadcast, telephonics and satellite communications, medical technologies and imaging, laser and fiber optics, microprocessors and the internet, petrochemicals and nuclear technologies. And let us not forget, this was all accomplished in the last hundred years. Several centuries after Bacon and Descartes' clarion calls for them. Yet it remains striking that science cannot say that science is good for human beings. Scientists and engineers tend to assume it, but admit they cannot prove that in scientific terms. Why? Because as we said, facts can be proven scientifically, but not values. But what then of engineering technology, the fruits of science? Well, from the point of view of science, more would be learned by nuclear proliferation and the bombs going off, but less clearly good for human beings. And what of longer life, delivered by better medical and life science? 
it's not clear that life in such diminished conditions is always desirable. In the advances in the technologies of war, as well as medicines in this next century, especially in robotics, machine learning, nanotech, and genetics, may destroy the species or the planet. However this may be, the point is still a good one and has been known as far back as Socrates' friendly accuser, the comet poet Aristophanes. From the point of view of natural science, human beings don't matter any more than any other beings, except insofar as they are capable of natural science. Science cannot say scientifically what is more important, in what sense. How could nature play favorites? The study of human things, or in Aristophanes' risable example, the anus of a fly. So we need an inquiry to reflect upon the goodness of science and engineering for human beings, a study of the liberal arts that raises and answers the question, why science? Why is it important for human life? In all such questions of so-called value or ends that address the human good are alive there. To wit, what is a friend? What is love? What is justice? Is there a god or gods? Miracles? What is the best way of life? In fact, all the most important human questions are precisely not objects of engineering mastery or modern science. Already, and I'll close with this, in 1949, Winston Churchill captured the stakes eloquently. Addressing MIT, he observed, science bestowed immense new powers on man and at the same time created conditions which were largely beyond his comprehension and still more beyond his control. While he nursed the illusion of growing mastery and exalted in his new trappings, he became the sport and presently the victim of tides and currents, whirlpools and tornadoes, amid which he was far more helpless than he had been for a long time. No technical knowledge can outweigh knowledge of the humanities, in the gaining of which philosophy and history walk hand in hand. Our inheritance of well-founded, slowly conceived codes of honor, morals and manners, the passionate convictions which so many hundreds of millions share together of the principles of freedom and justice are far more precious to us than anything which scientific discoveries could bestow. It is therefore above all things important that the moral philosophy and spiritual conceptions of men and nations should hold their own amid these formidable scientific evolutions. There never was a time when the inherent virtue of human beings required more strong and confident expression in daily life. There never was a time when the hope of immortality and the disdain of earthly power and achievement were more necessary for the safety of the children of men. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Susan Henking, um, who is president of Shimer College in Chicago. Trained in religious studies at the University of Chicago, Henking has published wild, what, widely on religion, psychology, and the history of sociology, gender, sexuality, HIV AIDS, diversity, and leadership in higher education, and is founding a series um, of teaching religious studies for Oxford University Press. Uh, I overheard her uh, talking earlier about PR in her institution and having uh, a, uh, PR releases that she writes and that uh, uh, a colleague or an assistant writes uh, uh, on her behalf. And she said the main difference between the two is the one that she writes end up um, littered with autocorrects um, that she, she doesn't catch and then she sa says things like I did wildly. Um, and um, I, thought, I thought about that and I thought to be an enemy of autocorrect is surely to be on the side of truth and justice. Um, so uh, I think we're, we're going to get a taste of that now and it's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, first, let me say thank you, as we all have, to Aviva and Aaron. And I think I want to particularly say it, I, I, I was conscious when Allison uh, was talking from Lafayette, um, how rarely we cross the silo of administrator, thinker, we are thinkers too, faculty, staff, those kinds of things to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I'm going to read you something that I'd like to serve as the backdrop for what I'm going to say. Um, and you'll understand that this, uh, so this arrived today at 4.24 p.m. And I need to tell you, Shimer College is located at 35th and State. Two individuals were shot off campus at 35th and State around 4 p.m. Chicago police are searching for one African-American male suspect in his early 20s with dreadlocks and possibly wearing an orange hoodie. He left the scene heading west. 
we are co-housed with an engineering school, Illinois Institute of Technology, so the next sentence will still make sense. IIT Public Safety is searching the Mies campus as a precaution. Be alert to your surroundings. Anyone observing the description of the suspect, please call dot, dot, dot. Now, I read that in part because I think it's very important to recognize that the practices and the thinking that we're engaged in occur in a context. And for me, part of that context is my past in these walls, where I was one of the a very early Har internal Harper fellow and the assistant to the then master of the social sciences collegiate division and eventual dean of the college. So I was born, as it were, uh, believing that one could be an administrator, a scholar, and a teacher, and those three things were not contradictory, nor should they be uh, siloed. Um, now, I had to get my, uh, my friend Don Levine to remove from my early job search letters the idea that I could be a dean because I couldn't get a job. And as soon as I took the darn thing out, I got a job. If you mean by that a, a tenure track job uh, teaching in, in the humanities and uh, the social sciences. So in the background, I want us to remember the importance of context, but also, I don't know how you felt, but when I opened that, I felt pretty upset. Now, it's partly because I have some responsibility, but it's also partly because um, we can have intellectual reflection on these matters, and we can also think about what, who's coming into our classrooms and whether they're experiencing these things in, in their lives. So I, I was going to start with my uh, with the traditional, I'm last, isn't that awful? But instead, I talk to you about something awful. So I'm going to go on from there to say a few things um, uh, that I think make it um, peculiar that I'm sitting here. Then I'm going to try to make some claims, and I'm going to try to, uh, uh, I'm going to emphasize the things that I think I haven't heard, because a lot of the things that I think I'm finding, uh, finding in other voices today. I think it's a particularly odd to have a president or two of them talk at a thing like this because our jobs and roles are very often uh, thought to be focused on tasks rather than ideas, on budgets and markets rather than anything else. We really are supposed to think about money, not education. We're actually higher education's anti-intellectuals. At least that's what I have been told repeatedly by my friends who think I've gone to the dark side. Now, it could also be odd to have the two particular ones you, you had up here because we're both from small liberal arts colleges, one from a teeny, teeny liberal arts college with 85 students, and the other one from a somewhat less abnormal size. Um, and it could also be odd that you have two women up here, right? Um, in my case, I'm a woman, a lesbian, a feminist, a first generation college goer. And so I was I come from a situation where I was originally told quite explicitly no liberal education for you. And it had to do with my demographic characteristics. All my female cousins did not go to college. My parents chose to send my sister and I to college. And we uh, both got substantial financial aid. I, for example, signed a loan that eventually becomes some of the loan funds that are out there that said I would go and fight in Vietnam and that I was waiving my right to being a conscientious objector Notice that that would have been irrelevant for me. Um, so I note that at the time I was not allowed in. Um, if you just pretend I'm a category for a minute. Now I'm overrepresented in liberal education. Right? White women are overrepresented. Um, and I'm dramatically underrepresented at the presidential level. Um, and another way of, of raising this issue is to say you can, you can, there is a, there, it, this is not causal, I do not think, but there's certainly a correlation that goes like this. The fewer women full professors you have, the higher prestige your institution is. It's, it's completely true. It's almost a, unilim, it's an, almost a linear uh, relationship. So I'm raising those things to tell you um, that coming last has its upsides and downsides. Um, I'm certainly first in the group of people who were affirmative action people coming into higher education, right? White, poor women. So you look at my CV, I don't like look like a white, poor woman. I look like a white woman who went to Duke in the University of Chicago. Okay, so in addition, I want to say this. I, I'm standing in a moment of nostalgia and thinking about the future, right? Th that to me is an important point that I think was just made a, a, uh, by several people to my right. Um, 
and so for me, it's nostalgia. I met liberal education not as an undergraduate, but in the core here when, oh my God, I had to teach Savage Mind to 18-year-olds, and I couldn't understand the book myself. Um, but I, and I also met it while I was an administrator in the college. Okay. And I was doing it because I was working 40 hours a week to put myself through graduate school, okay. even though I had a free ride because I did need shampoo. Um, so now I'm going to start sounding a little more, slightly more serious. There's nothing quite like reflecting on Weber while you're enacting bureaucratic work. <laughs> There's nothing quite like remembering Audre Lorde questioning the value of the master's tools for dismantling the master's house alongside Ebony and Ivy, which if you haven't read it, you should, uh, that traces the very roots of today's higher education and our treasured American liberal education to slavery. There's nothing quite like having a social justice orientation and actually knowing who Rockefeller was. There's nothing like thinking through the merits of academic freedom and perhaps tenure while realizing the or its origins in arguments that were inherently racist and anti-immigrant, resting as they did on um, arguments against the employment of Chinese laborers to construct railroads. There's nothing like preaching to the choir in a room which may know but not understand that the vast majority of what we call education, perhaps especially liberal education, occurs in places quite unlike this place. Even in the domestic circumstances, a lot more like what was described in Cairo and the 35th in state than what, although I was mugged in Hyde Park four times while a graduate student, right? But it, it, is, it is the case that most of us aren't in Research One universities in uh, islands um, on the south side of Chicago. Um, now, we could take the question that we're being asked, what's the task of the liberal educator, and proliferate it into many other classes. What I want to do is make a couple assertions. I'm going to assert that the task of the liberal educator, like the person of the liberal educator, includes both those who enter the classroom and create curricula, who undertake scholarship and research, but also those of us who've wandered off to the dark side. My presence and that of a few others asserts the importance of institutions that are not, definitely not research ones. It also asserts the importance of people who enable, and I use that term advisedly, it's got a little bit of an edge to it, um, students and faculty to get in the room together. Market conditions com com complicating that ev every moment. So my, um, my assertions are rooted in my experience and my expertise, in my sense that the task of the liberal educator includes not only building the ideas of liberal education, but co-creating cultural and institutional sites, like Cairo, um, roles and institutions where it's possible for such an education to occur. Now, at the risk of sounding like a heretic, I will say, you know, somebody did invent the Khan Academy and TED Talks, for example. Um, and that may, those may be as important as what I experienced in the 1970s and 1980s, or what some people in the mid-1950s experienced when they bought those horrifying encyclopedias of the great books. Uh, they're in, on onion skin, you, can, you can't read them. Uh, whether we think of uh, cultural and institutional sites that we create as a great good place, as a digital world, as the community colleges, which we've alluded to but are not present here, um, as coding camps that are taking place all over the South Side, right? Um, building and sustaining those kinds of cultural and institutional sites and roles, especially in today's climate, is a critical task for the liberal educator, whoever she is, and I think it's a major ethical demand on our time. Now, I will say a caveat, then I'll uh, it's caused by things everybody said. I think this means we've got to work out where our loyalties lie. Is my loyalty to religious studies, is my loyalty to whatever institution, I, I spent 30 years at the same institution, so am I a Hobart and William Smith faculty member, now I spent four years at Shimer, am I a Shimer faculty member, or do I hold responsibility, as lots of people we've seen here claim, to the whole of higher education and liberal education in our country? We are not necessarily helping people as they move through the, and into the professoriate or other roles in higher education to take responsibility for the whole. Um, now, 
my ruminations, you'll be shocked to know, are not that different from everyone else's. They just have different sources. So my first set of ruminations on this has to do with work and life. And I was influenced in this thinking by Adrian Rich. So I want to just read you a quotation. Very, uh, I'll, I'll amend it to pretty short so I can uh, try to stay in my amount of time here. You must write and read as if your life depended on it. To read as if your life depended on it would mean to let into your readings your beliefs, the swirl of your dream life, the physical sensations of your ordinary carnal life, and simultaneously to allow what you're reading to pierce the routines, safe and impermeable, in which ordinary carnal life is tracked, charted, and channeled. And she goes on to talk about what it means to write as if your life depends on it. Now, she does not think that education should be easy, and she's not just talking to students. She is talking to all of us in this essay. It should not be easy. Um, it should not produce or enact passivity. Um, it, in fact, is something one claims rather than receives, that one demands of oneself and others around us. Done well, um, and I'll quote someone else who's influenced me, Sharon Parks has called education that's done well uh, a moment of conscious conflict which pulls together a livable tension of restless opposites. Now, speaking for me when trying to finish my dissertation, I wasn't sure what livable meant in that sentence. But it is clearly the case that it's not about um, um, resolution always. It is also about struggle. Now, I might say that, that it's clearly not going to happen in four years, two years, six years, or eight years. It's clearly a lifelong task. But I, what I am asserting here is that not only are we responsible for the institutions or the this, this social and cultural sites, but we also should be doing this as if our lives, lives depend upon it. And I will say I think it's because they do. Uh, now, we can certainly, it's the case that I'm with everybody else. Education should not cause us to be impoverished, depressed, burned out faculty members, or impoverished, depressed, burned out recent graduates, right? Um, we shouldn't cause ourselves, we should, you know, there are many other things we need, but we also need to survive. So at Shimer, we have these all community retreats every year. It's the staff, the faculty, and, and, and we read something together, and, and we discuss it. And I can still remember my first one when uh, the bursar raised her hand. She's an uh, African-American woman who was homeless for 15 years in Chicago as a result of a domestic violence situation. Someone at IIT helped her get a job to get an education. She's worked at Chimer for quite some time, and she raised her hand and said, I don't really care if they're stealing. I care if they eat. And so I don't really care if they go to the University of Chicago. I don't care if they go to Chimer. I only care that they eat. So show me how the people from Mania come to eat. She, by the way, feeds them is what she actually does. She quite literally gives money she can't afford to feed students across the city. So I, you know, I do think it's important to say that survival matters, but I also think that, um, you know, all of us are of an age where we know who Abraham Maslow is. Um, survival's not enough for anybody. So my second one, uh, also not not unlike everybody else's, is to think about self and other. Um, and I see I'm, my time is up, so I'm just going to say that if I, I if we're educating ourselves for thoughtfulness both personal thoughtfulness and intellectual thoughtfulness, what I think that means is that we're, it's not about being considerate. It's about bystander intervention on behalf of justice. And I think that's both an individual responsibility and an institutional responsibility. College presidents are told all the time that they can't say that, and they certainly can't do that. I am at a place where really, what difference does it make? I got 85 students. I'm the margin of the margin of the margin. So I can say it. But what is wrong that we create a world where presidents cannot say, I am making the just decision, though it will cost us money? What is wrong? Okay. Last but not least, I'll tell you this. I wrote an article some time ago in Inside Higher Education about what it meant to be an inside out college president. And my original question was, did I have to give up critical pedagogy to be a president? Turns out, yes, that's what I'm even trying to read. But, um, you know, everybody I know who has a job and gets a job, a junior colleagues, um, administrators, worries that they are now trapped 
rather than free. And that's in itself a, a deeply problematic thing. So I kept asking myself, and I've done it in public in Inside Higher Education, can I actually say what I think? Can I believe in critical pedagogy that asks people to question authority? Am I allowed to think about higher education beyond the business model? Do I have to be a proponent of neoliberalism? Am I allowed to speak truth to power? Or do I only serve power in this role? Now, my answer, I hope you can imagine, is this. But here's the trap. Um, on the one hand, business and financial plans, market pressures, and related matters call for our attention and even devotion. One's mission fails if your books don't balance. I use the word books just to be silly. Your mission also fails if the only thing that happens is your books balance. That's what I think is crucial for us to remember. Um, in my case, right, struggling is part of the lesson, it's part of what a higher education should be showing people is that there's struggle. Now, I also agree that there's play. And so uh, I'll re leave you at the very last with a certain moment from um, Rebecca Solnit, the student came and gave to me and told me I was an idiot because I hadn't read this yet. Hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and the unknowable, an alternative to the certainty of both optimist and pessimist. Optimists think it will all be fine without our involvement. Pessimists take the opposite position. Oh no, the world is ending. Both excuse themselves from acting. It's the belief that what we do matters, even though how and when it will matter, who and what it may impact, are not things that we can know beforehand. It's that belief and our action on it that is the basis of hope. I've got to stop because I'm past my time. There you go. Ahead of your time, or about time. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I'm left wondering what if uh, presidents of an institution uh, 10 times your size or 100 times your size uh, started thinking and acting in a similar way. Um, we've got uh, a good amount of time for Q&A and I'm going to start it off um, um, amongst the, the panel and then uh, open it up to the floor for questions for the panel and we may even have some time uh, if there are still outstanding questions or thoughts uh, that help us wrap up uh, the entire event. So I'm just going to uh, kick it over to the panel to ask any questions to each other that they might have or any further um, uh, provocations for each other that, that uh, came up in the course of the panel. I'm dying to ask if they read Benjamin in Cairo, if, you re if you're reading it with people in Cairo. Around tea, yes, yes. <laughs> There was a, a phrase you used that I, I didn't understand, the dark side? Oh, it's, um, it, basically it means that <laughs> you were a faculty member, but you've given up all of your decency and reasonableness and become a president. It's a, it's a joke. It's a joke. Although yeah. it is fairly, it is taken seriously by some people, right? Because they, there is a view that it is difficult to remain connected to the to the reasons one goes into higher education, at least in my case, for the first place. So mm. when I first became, did administrative work, right, I was, a, I was a very recently tenured faculty member and became um, the acting provost for a couple years, two years after I got tenure. And, you know, it was, it was a joke, but I also stopped getting invited to all the faculty parties. Mm. So it's, and it was a small town. So you can see there's, there's an edge to it. Okay, so follow-up question to this. Because you're the second person today to refer uh, to um, the, the silo, the word silo. You well, moved from a faculty, being yeah. a faculty member, to being the president mm -hmm. now. And you said that as you shifted, you became, uh, you assumed a more anti-intellectualist role. Yeah. But 
aren't you reinforcing that divide by kind of saying this is anti, this is intellectualist, this is anti-intellectualist? I'm more interested in, in the shift in itself. It, why would we continue to think of it as silos or of different sides rather than thinking a bit more about the connector? I believe the, I, I actually believe that one of the strongest critiques of um, intellectual work in the past 30 years has been the feminist critique of a theory practice divide that's, um, that's facile. Uh, but I don't think that we've been as um, good at creating a culture which focuses on the practice of higher education as a legitimate enterprise. If, that pra if by that practice it's taken us a long time to get to where teaching is viewed as something for the, the, the real scholars, and it's taken us, I think, a long time to get to where, and I don't think we're there, where we think that administrators in general might be intellectuals. Now, I don't actually think I'm anti-intellectual. I think, um, you know, I, um, but I'm unusual because I went directly from a faculty person to being a president. And so in presidential circles, people think that I'm weird because I, I don't know, know who Walt Walter Benjamin is. People are like, I know what intersectionality is. People that I'm with who are deeply intellectual, wonderful people are not embedded in the intellectual debate in quite the same way. But also I'm not in, at the sort of top level of institutions here. So some of them have enough support structures that they can continue to publish and be active. But lots of presidents are in the middle, and they have almost no support structure, and they have a 24 and 7, 365 you know, job. So I, I agree with you, though. I think, in fact, um, one of the things that's special about Scheimer is because it is such an odd place, almost every faculty member has done some of the administrative jobs. Right? So one of them was chief development officer, and one of them was the admissions officer. And one of them was actually the janitor. And so there's ways in which, right, and we, our physical setup is every other office, faculty, administrator, faculty, administrator, faculty, administrator. So we, you know, and if I can't, if I'm not there, somebody else is doing my stuff. So, and until 10 years ago, the president taught a full-time load. I was struck with the formula <coughs> of Karim's informal urbanity was a very good description of Everson's essays, or Socrates himself, the first yeah. liberal educator. Mm. Um, just an observation. And, and then it, it struck me that all of us are trying to convey the oddity of a kind of teaching like theirs that's a transmission of an experience rather than a conveying of information. Right. And yet that experience is so highly tied to the individuality, it's very hard to judge. Another random observation, Rana's prison and Kareem's Cairo, um, these repressive environments that turn out to be the most hospitable for liberal education, thereby vindicating Brian Garston's thesis <laughs> that maybe democracy enervates or gets in the way or produces obstacles to general liberal education. Question. That's what the neoliberal institution is trying to do, create a better educational environment through oppression. Uh, 